Lord, as we open your word this morning, I ask for you to allow me to lift up Jesus. Hide me behind his cross. Amen. Life is difficult. I went to a Walla Walla and Andrews University with a couple named Barry and Becky Curtis. They now pastor in Salt Lake City, Utah, but 15 years ago they were pastoring in Montana. It was camp meeting and they were driving home after camp meeting. They were in two vehicles. Becky was in a Jeep Cherokee with her son. I believe he was like 11 or 12. And then Barry was in another vehicle with their daughter and another son. Barry was in front of them, and in his river mirror, he saw the accident. Becky went to sleep, and the vehicle rolled numerous times, and uh, to his horror, Barry was watching in the river mirrors. He watched the accident unfold. He obviously rushed back. Um, they were so far out in Montana that it took an hour for the aid vehicles to reach them. During that time, um, Barry stood beside the vehicle. Uh, Becky somehow knew her neck was broken, and so he could not get her out. He had to leave her where she was so that the rescue workers could take her out safely. Um, would you advance? Th um, there's Becky and Barry, and then one more picture. Um, that is the place where the accident took place, a place called Wisdom, Montana. Now, when we breathe, we don't think about breathing. Our nervous system helps us with that. But because there was damage to her spinal cord, her nervous system was not telling her to breathe. She had to consciously choose to breathe. Uh, could you advance one more picture? So that's the, the, the vehicle that um, was uh, what happened. In the hour it took for the uh, aid vehicles to get there, Becky just stood there beside, or Barry stood there beside the car and, and just kept talking to Becky and urging her to breathe. The, the ambulance that came, came from a very small town in Montana. And the man who ran the ambulance had been a Vietnam veteran and not a lot of accidents happened, but he wanted to be prepared that if there was a need to take care of people as best he could. So he raised the money to get a, a special tool to extract someone from a vehicle from an accident like this. Can we advance to the, to the next picture? So um, they had had that tool in the ambulance for two weeks. But they had it that day. And without that tool, they would not have been able to save Becky's life. This happened 15 years ago, and they have not used that tool in, the, in those 15 years. But they had it that day. They were to get, able to get her out of the vehicle get her into the ambulance and get her to the hospital. Another point, the, um, in Butte, Montana, it's not a, a huge city, and they had a trauma center. And the reason they had a trauma center is that a, a young man had grown up in Butte, Montana. He had gone away and studied and become a world-class surgeon, and he wanted to come back and help his local community. So he came back to Butte, Montana, and he assembled the equipment and the team to have a trauma center. 
And so they could help Becky with this serious injury. And when they got her into the hospital, and now she's in the surgeon's hands, my friend Barry, overwhelmed, says this was the worst day of his life. But what he did is he sat down with a pen and a piece of paper, and he started writing down praises to God for things that had gone right. Now, I would have given him, I would probably at that moment, I would not be thinking of praising God for things that had gone right. I would have been overwhelmed. But Barry sat down and made a list. And here are, I'm going to share with you just three things on the list that had gone right. The first one was the ambulance driver with the special tool. The second thing is that um, the grass in that area of Montana usually is very dry and flammable. And the catalytic converter had been just pouring heat onto the ground, but it had rained, and so the grass was lush and green and not flammable. And that saved her life. And then he praised God for the world-class surgeon that was in that small little Montana town. On the worst day of his life, he wrote a list of praises to God. Becky had a partially damaged spinal cord, and she had to relearn to walk. She had a C4 spinal injury, very high in the, the spinal cord. One, um, something very meaningful, while she was in the hospital, she was there for a long time. And her family, of course, was around her. But one day they went to get some food in the hospital cafeteria, and she was all alone in her room. And she was just feeling alone, and she was feeling sad. And she was feeling the, what she had lost. And she just cried out to Jesus. And she says, with no one in the room, someone held her hand. She could feel a hand in hers. Someone held her hand. Her husband jokes, yeah, right, the, the minute I leave the room, <laughs> Jesus shows up. <laughs> Later, she developed what she called burning nerve pain from the neck down. And this did not go away. So she read and she studied, and she learned about something called neuroplasticity, that there are nine areas of the brain that experience pain, and how by what we focus on, we can actually rewire and refocus our brain. Because this pain, this burning nerve pain for Becky is not going to go away. It's with her now. And yet she is a joyful person. You remember in the scripture it says when we pray with thanksgiving in Philippians chapter 4. When we pray with thanksgiving that God's peace guards our hearts and our minds. Praying with thanksgiving, it refocuses our brain so that, that God's peace. Well, as she refocused her brain, she is able to manage that burning nerve pain. One of the things that she learned is it's called hunting for the good. In other words, focusing on what is good and what God has done. The blessings, the grace that God has given. And that is something, and wouldn't you know it now, she coaches people in chronic pain. And they know that she understands they know she's not talking theory. She's talking something that a journey she walks in. Life is difficult. And in life, there's not only physical pain. In my life, I've experienced that emotional pain is much more difficult for me than physical pain. Today, I want you to strap on your seatbelts and we're going to go for a, a brief airplane ride 
over the scriptures, and we're going to land on two different airfields, two different times, with the same family, but in different areas, uh, different eras of the family to look at how God interacted with people at a very difficult and painful time and how God was there and how we can learn that God sees us and hears us when life is difficult. And I believe that these lessons we can learn are directly applicable to us sharing our faith in Jesus and sharing the good news with other people. Because our test becomes our testimony. So the first one I want to look at is a young woman who was trapped. Could you look at the next slide, please? Oh, then there's a picture of Barry and Becky now. Next slide, please. Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Isn't it interesting how as humans, when something doesn't go the way we want, we say, God has done this to me. So many times, something painful has happened, and I've heard, had people say to me, why would God do this to me? Have you ever done that? I have. I've done that before. The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Now, this is probably one of the most unusual husband-wife conversations in the history of marriage. Sarai was greatly blessed. In the scriptures... She was probably the most beautiful woman talked about in Scripture. She was so beautiful that her husband was paranoid that somebody was going to kill him and take his wife. Her husband adored her and loved her. They were a prosperous, successful family. Sarah was greatly blessed. And yet, the thing she wanted the most, she wanted to be a mother and have a child, and it wasn't happening. And what made it even worse is God had told her husband that through his line, through his descendants, the Messiah would be born. And so she had this promise that God had made and yet it wasn't happening. Waiting on the Lord is a very difficult thing for us. One author called it God's waiting room. And we don't like God's waiting room. And so she had the promise. She knew what God's will was, but it wasn't happening. And so she decided she needed to help God keep his promise. It's a dangerous thing when we want to help God keep his promises. Because what, when we do that, what we're doing is we're trying to accomplish something. We're fighting a spiritual battle in the flesh. And that doesn't work well. Because when we try to fight a spiritual battle in the flesh, we will veer out of God's will and we will, we will try to use the human means that are at our disposal. So she saw this young slave girl, and she thought, surrogate parenthood. I could have my husband have a baby with her, and then I could adopt the baby, and God's promise is kept, and I just helped God. So... That's what she did. You notice the line, perhaps I can build a family through her. It's emphasis on what I do instead of what God is doing. And maybe my waiting in God's waiting room is God waiting for me to really put it in his hands and trust him. Sometimes 
as we, as I think of like trusting God is like swinging in a swing. And we want to soar in the air, but we want to keep one foot on the ground. And it doesn't work that way. To soar in a swing, you have to trust the swing. You have to put your weight in the swing. And to really trust God, sometimes what holds God's back, holds God back from, from fulfilling the promises is my lack of trust. Because if he fulfills the promise, with that attitude, Sarah would have said, oh, look what I did. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Well, could we don't go to the next slide? Abram agreed to what Sarah said. Now, ladies, I have to think that there was something inside Sarah that was hoping he would not agree. Even though it was her idea, I have to think she was hoping he would say, no, you're the only one for me. There's, there are strong parallels to this story and the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. Eve took the fruit and gave it to Adam. And the Bible says Adam listened to Eve. Sarah took her slave girl and brought her to Abraham, and it said Abram agreed. Adam and Eve eating the fruit led to incredible pain brought into this planet. Abram and Sarah departing from God's will and trying to fight a spiritual battle in the flesh brought incredible pain on their family. But I would like to ask you, if you go visit the Middle East today, how much pain has this this family decision caused in the thousands of years since then? How much pain? When we depart from trusting God and following his word and his will to our own plans, we cause pain to ourselves, our lives, our families, and the ripples spread out. Hagar was an Egyptian and she was a slave. It's interesting how Race and slavery show themselves. Hagar did not have a choice. She had no agency. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave him to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. Now, I want you to think about this for just a moment. That night that Sarai walked and brought Hagar to Abram's tent was a painful night for Sarah. We inflict pain on ourselves when we do not put things in God's hands and trust them there. We inflict pain on ourselves. Could you go to the next one, please? When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you're responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. It fascinates me that when we, de we depart from God's will and do things our way, by the way, what was Eve wanting when she ate the fruit? She wanted to be like God. Is there anything wrong with wanting to be like God? No. But we get to be like God by spending time with him and becoming friends with him and opening up our hearts to him. And any other way is idolatry. So now Sarai, so remember in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve turned and blamed each other. When we depart from God's will, it will always lead to blaming someone.
So now she blames him. You are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. So Sarah's, Sarai's position was threatened. There's a lot of bitterness in her words. Abram's on the hot seat. Can you imagine the tension in that home? The breakfast table must have been a very unpleasant place. Indigestion. With no Pepto-Bismol. The next verse, please. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. Are you capable of being mean? Are you capable of establishing your dominance over someone? If, if you feel threatened, are you capable of proving yourself and your, your power? If someone, if you have leverage and power over someone, are you capable of putting them in their place? Are you capable of pride? Are you capable of, of venting your anger and punishing people? When I look in the mirror, it horrifies me. And that's why I have to go to Jesus and say, I need a new heart. Ladies, I have a wife, I have a daughter, I have three sisters. My mother is passed on, but I loved her dearly. I'm not anti-women at all. But I want to ask you a simple question. Are women capable of being mean to each other? Could you imagine that those dynamics how mean Sarah was to Hagar. Could you picture that? That Hebrew word, mistreated. There's a connotation of violence there. And I want to tell you something else. What ethnic background was Hagar? She was Egyptian. Abram and Sarah are Hebrews. She was a slave. Let's fast forward a few generations, and all of the Hebrews were slaves of the Egyptians. What goes around comes around, and how we treat people circles around in life back onto us. And the same Hebrew word, mistreated, how Sarah mistreated Hagar, is the same word where the Egyptians mistreated the, Egypt, the Israelite slaves, same word. Let's go to the next slide. By the way, I have a Chinese son who lives in my home. He's not my son, he's an exchange student, but he's our Chinese son. He lives in my home. He's from Beijing, China and he's here studying, and he does not come from a Christian background. And yesterday, I was in the kitchen, cooking, and he came in the kitchen, and he started telling me about an assignment he had done, where he was asking the other international students, how do you like Auburn Academy? And he said, they told him, the people are nice here, the students, and the faculty are nice here. And then he told me about a relative of his, a Chinese student who goes to public school in a town here in Washington State and is bullied because he's Asian. And people bully him because they blame him for the COVID virus. And he has, the, the Asian students compared notes and they heard in California where Asian students are bullied. Bullying is about a need to establish our dominant, dominance over people and to vent our frustrations. Lord, keep us from that. And then he said something that touched my heart because 
this young man has lived in my home four years, and we're respectful. He's never talked to me about faith. But he said this. This is a Christian school. Maybe that's why they're nice. Because they believe everyone is equal. And I bow my head and praise Jesus. Because don't we believe as Christians that everyone is equal and we are brothers and sisters? No matter our race, no matter our, what country we're from, no matter the color of our skin, we are one in Christ. Do we believe that? So we can be nice to each other. We can love each other. And that glorifies Jesus. And if he takes away from him, oh, Christians, because they're Christians, they believe everyone's equal and they're nice, that's a pretty powerful message to take with them. So, Hagar, it's so bad that she runs away. And what's interesting is you, where, she, where the angel found her, she was on the road towards Egypt where she was from. Would a pregnant woman alone on foot get there that far? It's not a chance. She's not going to make it alive. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that heaven goes looking for us? We don't find God. He finds us. Now, we say yes. We let him. We allow him. But praise God, Jesus said he came to seek and save the lost. David and Ronnie, praise God, he found them. And they said yes. And may he, may he find many other people here in Tacoma. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? We could spend the whole sermon on that one question. Where have you come from and where are you going? God comes asking questions. So if you find you're wrestling with questions, that means God is coming to you. Let's go to the next verse. I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord, by the way, I believe this was Jesus. Because an angel meant a messenger, and sometimes Jesus came as a, as a messenger. I believe this was Jesus, and later on we'll see some actual biblical evidence for that. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. Then the angel added, I will increase your descendants so much they will be too numerous to count. He, he asked Hagar to go back to an enemy. That's a hard thing. To go back to a place where you were mistreated. One of the most powerful disciplines of the Christian life is to turn enemies into friends. I believe that's the best of, one of the best ways of doing evangelism we could do. A spirit of not seeing people as enemies, but as seeing them as friends. To go back with a different attitude. Because remember, Hagar despised Sarai when she knew she was pregnant. There was some one-upsmanship. Sarah didn't behave well, but Hagar had a different attitude. He's saying, go back with a different attitude. Would you go to the next one? Then the angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. The name Ishmael meant God hears. So the rest of, of, of his whole life, when she called her son, she would be reminded that God heard her pain. God hears, time for dinner. God hears, put your toys away, it's time to go to bed. God hears. This is the first, this blows me away. This blows me away. Two things. This is the first time in scripture 
where God names a child before he's born. And he chose this child in a painful situation where he named the baby. How would you like to have a message from God if you're a couple's pregnant where God says, I want you to name your child this? What an honor would that be, huh? And then another thing, God addresses her by name, Hagar. This is the only time in the Bible where, you know, it records a conversation with God where God said a woman's name. And look which one he chose to do. Someone of another race and someone of a low socioeconomic status. Because God is showing us how he cares for people and their pain. And he doesn't look like to the royal family of England, you know, the, the people in our world that are considered important. He goes looking for people and he sees their heart. Let's go to the next one. He, he describes her boy. He says, he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he will leave in hostility towards his brothers. Is God saying he's going to make him that way? No. We, we know some things about how the prenatal influence affects unborn children. And I believe what God is saying is that conflict that Hagar was experiencing it releases that adrenaline, that fight or flight, and that impacted her baby and made him combative. He was a fighter. Let's go to the next one. Now, this, this blows me away. I am in awe of what happened here. She gave God a nickname. What a personal, intimate encounter with God. He says, he spoke her name. He told her what to name her child. And she was so touched, she gave God a name. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. What difference does it make if God sees our pain and sees our story? He knows our lives and he sees. Many times in our lives we go through life feeling invisible, unseen. Here she was, not in, she was a slave girl being used against her will to be a surrogate mom. And God saw and he heard. And she was so touched, she gave God a name. This is relationship talk, friends. God wants to be our friend. My kids have certain names they call me that, are, that mean a lot to me. They're affectionate. They're family. Only family knows. And it's, it's, a fa it's personal. And it's very meaningful. I have now seen the one who sees me. And the reason I think it was Jesus, it said, you are the God who sees me. Do you believe that God sees you? That he knows your story? He knows your pain? He knows those secrets you will never tell anyone. He knows everything. And he cares. You are the God who sees me. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. She went back and told Abram. She's a slave girl, but she told him the story, and so Abram called him Ishmael, which meant God hears. God hears your heart. He cares about your emotions. He doesn't overrule the natural consequence of our choices. Sarah and Abram made a choice. God didn't overrule it. He doesn't even always overrule when choices are made. 
that affect us where we don't make the choice. How many of you know someone hurt, has been hurt by a drunk driver? Your friend, the person that was hurt, was it their choice? No. Human beings in this world, their choices affect each other. What difference does it make if God sees you and if he hears? It makes all the difference. Because we're not alone. We have a father. And we are precious we are valued. Our lives have an eternal value, and there is meaning to our story. Can you see her? Running away at a truck stop, crying, alone, and God came to her saw and he heard we're going to get up on our plane we're going to go to Genesis chapter 29 another woman Jacob traveled to find a wife Jacob came from a wealthy family but you remember he had deceived his father to get the blessing and how did dad punish him Isaac his dad sent him off to find a wife with no family resources when Isaac's father sent to get him a wife, they had a whole caravan of camels, they had gold and silver. Jacob is sent off by himself on foot, not even a family car. And he goes to find a wife, and he meets a beautiful girl named Rachel, and he falls in love with her. And so he makes a, a deal with her dad that he will work seven years to be able to marry Rachel. And the text said he loved her so much that that seven years were like one day. I mean, he was seriously flipped over this girl. The time went by, the wedding happens. And her father was a tricky man. And so the wedding is over, and it's time for him to go on the honeymoon. And they didn't have electric lights, it was dark. And he brings, instead of Rachel, he brings her sister Leah. And Jacob doesn't know. And so they go on their honeymoon. Could you imagine Leah? What would it be like for her being held tenderly by this man who thinks she's her sister? I don't think she slept at all that night dreading the morning when the light, the sunlight comes up. I mean, he can't pull his phone out, turn on his phone flashlight. Who are you? No. So in the morning, she is going to see that anger and that rejection, and she's going to feel not wanted. So that's what happened. He was very angry. He went to his father-in-law. What have you done? And the father-in-law said, okay. Finish your honeymoon with Leah. Work for me another seven years, and then you can marry Rachel. Two for the price of two. Could you imagine that honeymoon for Leah? Being with a sullen, cold husband who wants someone else, and that someone else is her sister. I imagine it was one of the most miserable honeymoons ever. Genesis 29, the next text, please. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, does God see our hearts? Does, does God see our story? And does he care? When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive. But Rachel remained childless. Now, don't ask me to explain this. I'm just reading the text. 
Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, It is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. She was a woman who wanted to be loved. She had a tender heart. And life and her father had not been kind to her. He set her up in, in probably the, one of the most awkward situations ever by tricking someone into marrying her. Surely my husband will love me now. The next text, please. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. And you notice this theme, that this theme of her life was, I want to be loved. The next verse, please. Again she conceived, and she gave birth to a son. Now at last my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. So he was named Levi. This woman's heart is bleeding. She wants to be loved. She wants to be valued. The next verse, please. She conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, This time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. It, it's, it's starting to get through to her. At first, it was about, okay, I want to be loved. So if I have these kids, my husband will love me. Now she's coming to the place where she's saying, God's been good to me. And I praise him. My friend Barry, on the worst day of his life, his wife's just broken her neck in an accident, and he's taking a moment to praise God on the worst day of his life. Paul and Silas, beaten, put into prison, put into stocks. The jailer does not give them medical care. Their backs are beaten badly. The stocks mean they have to sit up painfully all night. And instead of complaining, they praised God in the prison. And at midnight, the whole prison was listening to them, praying and singing and praising God. And then God sent an earthquake, and it shook the chains loose, and it opened the doors. And the jailer came running. He would have been asleep. He came running. And when he saw the doors open, he thought the prisoners escaped. He drew his sword to kill himself. And Paul was standing at the door, guarding and he said, we're all here. Don't harm yourself. And the jailer, who had been cruel, who had not washed their wounds, who had put him in an inner cell, and then to insult injury, put them in stocks. The jailer had been cruel, and Paul showed kindness in return for cruelty. And he showed grace. And this Roman jailer who had no interest in God said, what must I do to be saved? There are some people you will only reach for them seeing a living Christianity in you. That my Chinese son, he said, maybe they're nice because they're Christians and they value everyone. There are some people you will only reach by loving them. There are some people who don't, know what, who don't want a Bible study. They don't know they have a need. But when they see Jesus living in you and loving them through you, they might be interested. So if you're going through a situation where someone is cruel to you, where someone has hurt you, maybe God is preparing you to reach jailers, to reach those people who aren't interested. I believe there are people that don't know they need God, and the only way we'll reach them is when they see how we love. So if God's put you in the crucible of learning to love, then he's getting you ready for something. Trust his heart. Praise his name. And put yourself in his hands. We all long to be loved. God cares about our tears. He sees the sparrow fall. He numbers the hairs of our head. He captures our tears in a bottle, the scripture says. 
He comforted Leah by, na by enabling her to have children. This is the first mention of divine activity in this family's life for 21 years. And it came on behalf of a woman, a married woman, who wanted to be loved. The Bible shows that God has incredible fondness for and value for women. And we should too. In the history of this planet, men, men have not always been kind to women on this planet. We need to treat them well. We need to value and appreciate them. We need to treat them with respect and dignity. Because God does. So maybe you have pain in your life. Look for where has God done for you what he did for Leah? where he showed kindness, where he showed grace. Would you go to the next picture, please? I want to see this very carefully. I love my mother dearly. I lost her last June. My mother was a good woman. But my mother had a very difficult childhood. And it was sometimes hard, given the pain that life had done, it was sometimes hard for her to show love, sometimes. Maybe some of you understand what I'm saying. And I didn't know. As a, as a grown man, I didn't know. Because I had this hole in my heart where I needed to be mothered. I didn't know. And God put this lady in my life. Her name is Betty Velez. She was a church member of mine. She's old enough to be my mom. And she just came alongside and just loves me. She's praying for me right now. Whenever I go preach somewhere, she prays for me. She'll send me a text, Bill, how are you? What can I pray for you for today? She just loves me. And it has met a big need in my heart. And I praise God. And so when I look at some of the deficits or some of the pain that I've had in my life, this story of Leah that God saw, and so he took a personal interest. God putting this, this lady in my life was an example of God reaching out and caring in a very, very personal way. You may have unmet needs. We live in a broken world. You may have pain. You may not even be aware of your brokenness. You may deal with loneliness, but God cares about our emotional health. And the cross is where Jesus took our sins and gives us his life. The cross shows how heaven feels about us, that we are that valuable, that he wants us to be part of his family. Praise God, David, you said yes. Praise God, Ronnie, you said yes. He cares that in a world where we're sometimes not loved, he notices, he cares. The Bible says he has drawn us with loving kindness, and he's loved us with an everlasting love. Fred Rogers was a great man. He was an ordained minister, and his ministry was to children. And he told children that there was something special about them, that they were valuable, that they had worth, and that their feelings were okay. He received a Lifetime Achievement Award, and he gave a very, very short speech, but he said something that I want you to hear. Oh, it's a beautiful night in this neighborhood. <laughs> so many people have helped me to come to this night. Some of you are here. Some are far away. Some are even in heaven. 
All of us have special ones who have loved us into being. Would you just take, along with me, 10 seconds to think of the people who have helped you become who you are? Those who have cared about you and wanted what was best for you in life. 10 seconds of silence. I'll watch the time. whomever you've been thinking about, how pleased they must be to know the difference you feel they've made. You know, they're the kind of people television does well to offer our world. Special thanks to my family and friends and to my coworkers in public broadcasting, family communications, and this academy for encouraging me allowing me all these years to be your neighbor. May God be with you. Thank you very much. He asked them to think who loved you and cared for you, for you, where, for you to be where you are now, and to think of those people and be thankful for those people, to hunt for the good, because there are people who've hurt us. There are people who've been disrespectful and unkind and betrayed us and lied about us. But then there are those people that God has used to be a blessing and who've loved us into who we are today. And he wants us to be that kind of per person for other people, to disciple them and love them for Jesus. In a world that is fixated on their own pain and their own story. God wants to lift our eyes to the God who sees me and who hears. And he wants us to tell other people about that God. Father in heaven, I thank and praise you for Jesus. I ask that we put our faith and our trust in you. And this morning, if you want to just put your life in God's hands and say, God, I want to trust you. I don't always understand. I'm in your waiting room, but I want to trust you. I want to follow you. I want to acknowledge you and let you direct my paths. I want to forgive the people who hurt me, and I want to turn enemies into friends. And I want to praise you for the times the many times where you've been good and you've watched over me. And I want to share your love. In the quietness of this moment, tell him that.